Dr. Michelle Cortella is a general practitioner with a special interest in behavioral pediatrics. She's also a researcher, author, and president of the American College of Pediatricians. Dr. Cortella serves on the Medical Committee of the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Inquiry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Cortella. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if I had to subtitle this, I would call it Eve, Adam's Upgrade. <laughs> um, okay, a little more seriously. These are two of my favorite uh, quotes. Actually, the first is a paraphrase of Dr. Leonard Sachs, who is an MD, PhD, a family practitioner, psychologist, and education specialist. He is a proponent of single sex education. Um, essentially, his worldview can be summarized by his research that the failure, our failure, to acknowledge and embrace true biological sex differences will reinforce restrictive and damaging stereotypes, such as boys are bad at art and girls are bad at math and science. And the following is a quote which I believe most accurately reflects what we now know uh, in genetics and uh, endocrinology. The differences between what girls and boys can do, they may not be large, but how boys and girls get there, how they perform tasks may be very large. Our hard drives, and by that I'm, I'm referring to genes, are in, uh, what our genes do for us are intrinsically different. We know that now. Um, but our software uh, overlaps. Uh, why am I talking about sex differences? It's important to talk about the language versus gender differences. I'm using sex uh, because I'm referring to the biological sciences. Gender has so many different definitions now that you really can't use the term and be precise and accurately understood. Um, initially, back, and you can actually go on Google and pull up old English uh, dictionaries and look up the definitions yourself. So originally, gender had nothing to do with people. It referred first and foremost to grammar, masculine nouns, feminine nouns, modifiers, and the such. Um, and if it referred to male and female, like sex, it typically was referring to animal husbandry. In the 1950s, that's when gender was given a different meaning and first injected into the medical literature by the sexologists, uh, John Money, Harry Benjamin. They were looking for a way to justify sex reassignment surgery, but knew that by using surgery, you can't change genes. So this was a uh, philosophical or uh, political definition, if you will. They said, you know what, we're going to say that we are treating an in the social expression of an internal sex identity. So they added this. Uh, in the 70s, we had uh, the feminists talk about a social sex that could be different from biological sex. And our radical feminist friends um, describe it as sex stereotypes being used to suppress women, uh, so the oppression of the patriarchy. So there's all these different definitions that are in use today, um, but I am focused on the biological sciences, psychological sciences, as it pertains to sex, in which we're talking about genes, reproductive capacity, or chromosomes. Why do we say it's binary? Where did this idea of the sexual binary come from? It, it comes from the fact that human beings reproduce sexually. You need, as was said earlier, you need the combination of male genetic material and female. And as far as sex being a biologic fact, it is dimorphic, male or female, depending on whether or not you have a Y chromosome. If you have the Y chromosome, you will develop along the male pathway. If you lack the Y chromosome, 
you will develop along the female pathway. And this is going to affect your anatomy, internal, external, as well as um, hormone secretion. And the two together, genes and hormones together, have incredible and important impact upon every organ system in our bodies, including the brain, which together with our environment, family, um, upbringing, social experiences, school experiences, together that comes in to give us who we really are and complex behaviors. So it's, this is really important to understand. It's a basic common knowledge uh, fact in behavioral genetics that complex human behaviors are not determined solely by genes or hormones. These things obviously affect what we are because we're all made out of DNA, <laughs> but by themselves would cannot account for complex behaviors. We, um, we are formed by nature and nurture. So biological sex declares itself uh, in utero. Whether or not you have that Y chromosome is determined at conception. And by eight weeks gestation, if you do have a Y chromosome, this is when you have testes and your testes begin to produce testosterone. That testosterone combines with the genes, with the genetic material you have, to give you the male anatomy. Um, and so, and this is what you see, the two, the two pathways. If you have the Y chromosome and the production of testosterone from your testes, you will develop the male reproductive system. In its absence, we have our female who is XX chromosomally. Now, this, this sexual dimorphism, it is genetic and it penetrates the whole person. Uh, by that, I mean that our, we have our sex chromosomes present in every single cell of our body. And as we go on, I'm going to talk about how within those sex chromosomes and within every tissue of the body, we now know that there are genes that are expressed differently in men than they are expressed in women. And there are other genes that are expressed only in one sex or the other. So our brain tissue is intrinsically different because girls do not have a Y chromosome. Females, their, their brain tissues are not exposed to the proteins created by the genes on the Y chromosome, for example. Um, so we have our genetic hardware and eventually a hormone, sex hormone cascade that impacts our brain organization and function together with our environment will influence our psychology, emotions, and behavior. And we're going to see later on, I'll, I'll give more specifics about the brain and the musculoskeletal system. The last three I'll say a little bit more about now. The last three, this is why it is critically important for medical doctors to treat their patients in accordance with their biological sex. If, if I were um, an internist and I had a patient come to me, a biological man who now identifies as a woman, so he would be a trans woman, and he asked me to address him as Susan. I could address him as Susan, but I sure as heck better treat him physiologically as a man. He's a man on estrogen, but he's still a man. Why? Because his chromosomes, which are in every single cell of his body, is driving his immune function, is affecting how his body will manifest disease, respond to my medicines, and manage, and, and how he'll be able to endure pain. I, this is pervasive. It doesn't matter how much estrogen I give to a normal, physically healthy biological man, it cannot change his DNA. And it cannot change um, how his Y chromosome has impacted these other systems. As an example, 
uh, immune function, women uh, are 10 times more likely to develop uh, autoimmune disease, some autoimmune diseases such as lupus. Women have a dramatically um, greater immune res uh, response to vaccines. As physicians, we need to know a person's biological sex to understand what, they, what risk factors they are. And this, is, and, and this sex specific uh, medicine, if you want to call it, is relatively new. Up until recently, women were treated as small men who have babies. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> um, and, and another, it, it, it's known that uh, women, uh, postmenopausal women, were being misdiagnosed. They were having heart attacks and dropping dead. Why? Because women present differently. Women are more likely to present with jaw pain, arm pain, uh, heartburn symptoms, nausea, vomiting, not so in men. One last example. There is a class of drug that is commonly used to treat irregular heart rhythms. In men, very good. You don't really need to worry about using it at all in men. But in women, it could actually put them into a deadly rhythm. So biology matters. And again, from a pastoral perspective, if you have someone who is trans-identifying, and my advice to, uh, to physicians or healthcare practitioners if we have them, it is, and they are, this is their sincere belief that they were born this way and they are not, they do not want to pursue counseling for any under, potential underlying issues. You can call them by a different name, but please realize, you know, your biological sex matters in your health. Okay, so a word we heard a little bit on intersex, I think, from Ryan's talk earlier. And um, so we have this general rule, the general rule based on reproduction, because in nature, reproduction is the rule. Uh, we have the sexual binary, and, uh, but there are also some genetic anomalies. So let's take it out of the sexual realm for a minute. There are many different genetic anomalies that we know, but exceptions do not invalidate the rule. Most human beings, the vast majority, have 23 chromosome pairs, and yet there are many children born with trisomy, meaning three chromosomes at number 21, or three chromosomes at number 13, three chromosomes at number 18. They tend to be life-limiting. We know these are exceptions. Babies born with these trisomies are equal in human dignity, but they do not prove that there is a spectrum of normal uh, human, you know, a variety, a spectrum of normal chromosomal presentation. So the same follows when we get to go to the sexual realm. And the first uh, precept, as you can see, I, I pulled from the Christian Medical Association, all anomalies of human biology are an outcome of the fall and do not invalidate God's design and creation or the inherent human dignity of the child. And an example in this realm, one example of intersex is ambiguous genitalia. It happens in approximately 1 to 1,500 or 2,000 births. If you want to learn more uh, about this particular issue, Online, I do recommend the North American Intersex Society. And I did come across another resource, which is excellent, by uh, Dr. Leonard Sachs. He, ha he has his own website. And um, if, so if you go to leonardsachs.com, he does have, I believe it's under the tab that says articles. He has published in a peer-reviewed paper, uh, it's entitled, How Common is Intersex? And it's a wonderful um, refutation of the recent claim that intersex uh, individuals make up 2% of the population. In short, um, Anne Fausto Sterling is um, a professor at Brown. She's not a medical doctor. Uh, 
in 2000 published a book, and I believe it was along the lines of the social construction of sex, and she defined, within her book, she defined intersex very broadly. And basically, if, you, if we as physicians were to take her definition of intersex, 99% of the individuals have chromosomes and reproductive anatomy that match. Normally, when we talk about intersex individuals, we are talking about individuals who have ambiguous genitalia or their chromosomes do not match their body. So if we stick to that definition of intersex, we are speaking of less than 0.02% of the population. So again, Dr. Leonard Sachs, who is LGB affirming, drleonardsachs.com, does have an excellent article about intersex. So as I alluded to before, the sexual binary goes much further than just our reproductive organs. Uh, very recently, and this is an open access journal, um, the landscape of sex, sex differential transcriptome and, it, and its, its expression and selection in human adults. Okay, mouthful. But basically, these authors who are researchers in Israel found at least 6,500 genes that make, so they're identical genes found in men and women that make different proteins in the two, two sexes. Um, and this is a scatter plot, and down below on the x-axis, they're listing, they're grouping the different tissues that they looked at. And so they examined, for example, fat cells from men and women, glandular cells, cardiovascular, brain, urinary tract, the, the whole gamut, 53 different tissues. And the different colors are, are showing how many different, um, how many genes they found similar in both sexes but producing different proteins. So sex differential expression in genes common to both sexes suggests that there are differences in the sex genetic architecture and physiology in tissues common to both sexes. So to be simple, in other words, if I have breast tissue is the most differentiated between the sexes. So if I take a man and I give him heavy doses of estrogen, he will develop breasts. But at a genetic level, a microscopic level, genetic level, masculine breast tissue is intrinsically different from that of women. And the same they found in the tissue from the left ventricle of the heart, skeletal muscle tissue, fat tissue, brain tissue, liver, as I said, up to 53. These were the ones they found the most uh, differentiation in, meaning over 100, over 100 differentially expressed genes in each of these. This in, uh, research group also found sex-specific genes. So they found 1,370 genes that are expressed in men alone. Not surprisingly, those are genes found in testes and the prostate. Another 49 are common to both men and women. They produce the same proteins in men and women, but men produce a whole lot more. And these, were, uh, these genes were found in skin, glandular tissue, and parts of the brain. In women, women have 26 genes in our reproductive system that are not found in men. Women have another 114 glandular and brain genes that are overexpressed. We, you know, we're the upgrade, you know, so on these we. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, so as I said, the hardware is, is different. And this goes a long way in explaining why, uh, and, and this is an image, this is actually uh, an article, an image that appeared in the Washington Post in 2014. You can find it online. Um, and I'll just comment on some of it. So as I said, we have genetically different skeletal muscle tissue. And it appears that men's 
muscle fibers, individual fibers, are actually larger than those of women, not just because of the fact that men have more testosterone, but they're intrinsically different. So men have more power. This is why you, could, you can take a woman and, and pump her with testosterone, and of course this is illegal if she's competing as a woman using testosterone, does build her muscle and she, has, she would have an unfair advantage over other women. But we can't turn her into a man. It's not going to give her a Y chromosome. Heart muscle, again, intrinsically different. Uh, men's hearts are also larger. Men's lung capacity is greater. So you take the two together, men have a greater aerobic capacity. They can use oxygen more efficiently. They, they can pump it out to their muscles more efficiently and effectively than women. So in the long term, men will um, exceed women in endurance. Now, caveat. If I take someone like Serena Williams and pit her against my husband in tennis, she will whip his butt. <laughs> right. So what I'm saying, so if we compare apples to apples, if in this case they are they have they are the in the image, it is representing an Olympic an Olympian trained athlete for men and an Olympian trained athlete for women. So if you compare apples to apples, because of our intrinsic genetic and hormonal differences. Um, men have certain advantages in terms of power and speed and oxygenation delivery. Women, uh, however, uh, <laughs> you can see the dancer with her foot up by her head, um, be not only because of the hormone differences, our hormones contribute to flexibility, but also because of the anatomy of our hip structure can allow for significantly more flexibility. Um, and again, you could go online and pull it up. It's a good article. So I alluded to this before, the brain tissue of men and women intrinsically different due to sex-specific genes in the brain as well as sex differentially expressed. Uh, so genes and sex hormones together do direct uh, sex-specific organization and function of the brain. So some of those differences uh, Dr. Savage spoke of and Dr. Wilcox, uh, we're going to get into those sort of on the biological level a little more. So men's brains are masculinized twofold, really. First, by their sex-specific and sex-differentially expressed genes, which are present from conception, and again, by um, male fetuses' own testosterone beginning at eight weeks conception. Now women, female fetuses, they have their own sex-specific and sex-differentially expressed genes and lack exposure right, they lack exposure to testosterone because they don't have testes, they're, they're girls. Um, their surge, their estrogen surge comes at puberty and where there's significant um, reorganization of the brain. So faces versus mobiles, we heard a little bit about this from Dr. Savage. This study took place one day, on the day of birth, in 102 infants, on the day of birth. So these were not infants who were socialized in any way. <laughs> the baby boys were over twice as likely to prefer the silent moving mobile. Baby girls more in tune with the smiling woman, smiling quiet woman. And what is really cool is that these differences, our eyes are different. And this is why, now learning, you know, social learning still takes place. But yes, in part, there are real biological differences that can explain this. We have a common eye anatomy, but the cell composition of the retina is different depending on whether you're a boy or a girl. The retina is at the back of the eyeball, um, and it converts the light into neurological signal. Um, behind the retina, you have the receptors, the photoreceptor layer, made up of rods which see black and white and the cones which transmit color to the, to the brain. Uh, the ganglion cells carry the signal from the rods and cones to different areas of the brain. There are two different ganglion cells. The P cells, which are very close to, I don't know if you can see the, the optic nerve, it's right up there. 
So the P cells are close to that field of vision that, and detect detail, like texture and color. The M cells are scattered throughout the retina, detect motion and direction, and not color. They're, they're connected to the rods, so they're black and white. So when the boy fetus at eight weeks starts generating his own testosterone, that testosterone in his system hits his retina, his developing eye in his retina, and makes it rich in the M cells, which are very sensitive to detecting movement through space. So it kind of makes sense that a boy baby on day one would find mobiles interesting. The female, in contrast, the unborn little girl, she only had estrogen being bathing her brain and her forming uh, uh, retina. She has a preponderance of P cells. So she's totally into detail. Color, texture, hey, give me, give, oh, face, are you kidding me? Oh yeah, that's where it's at. And, uh, you know, and, and evolutionarily speaking, uh, it's kind of better for a mom to be interested and want to gaze at her infant's face versus, I don't know, like the taxi cab going down the street, or right? Okay, so even the visual system differs. Uh, the, how the signals travel from the eye and what parts of the brain they go to, that also differs by sex. So P cells and M cells both carry signals to the cortex of the brain for their appropriate analysis, but the pathways in between girls and boys differ. So again, it's, it's the how, right? It's, it's not the question of can boys see color and be taught to pay attention to texture, but it's how, it's the how where they're different. So in this sense, children's behavioral sex difference, partly biological. We, ha we do have studies in, in babies as young as nine months. Girls will prefer dolls, boys prefer trucks. Um, and I liked this, in terms of art, you know, how, how did pink become a girly color? Well, let's change the question. How is it that blue became a boy's color? Well, interestingly, again, blue is very close to that black, white, gray, silver spectrum, and that's more what their eyes are wired to. Okay, so it kind of makes sense. But learning and socialization still happens. I have three boys and a little girl. She wanted absolutely zero to do with dolls, I think, before like she went to kindergarten and started making friends with other girls, really. Uh, she wanted letter at the matchbox cars. And, but this was very interesting because in preschool, she made her first best friend, and they would come over, and Campbell did not have brothers, but she saw, and, and Mariana had no dolls. She had no, my mother tried to get her into dolls. She ignored it. She was, out. hey, my, my brother, her oldest brother was seven. So they went seven, five, uh, and there's only 19 months between her and her other brother. She wanted after them. And what, what were they into? Uh, the Flash, Batman, Superman, and Matchbox cars. So when her little friend comes over, they, she come on, Campbell, bringing her over to the matchbox cars. But they didn't crash them into things. <laughs> they took the matchbox, this was very funny, they took the matchbox, they, they played house of sorts. I mean, we didn't even have a dollhouse, but you know, they, they were having little like conversations and doing little social things with the matchbox cars. <laughs> anyway. Um, so this is, again, getting better back to the, the biological. Girls' brains, even in, again, newborn, the brains we hear differently. Newborn girls have had their hearing tested at the same time as the boys, same age, and from birth are up to 80, they can hear or detect, I shouldn't say hear, but they can detect speech tones 80% greater than that of newborn boys. And they, have, they are substantially more sensitive in the tone range necessary to discriminate speech. And again, this is, you know, I, I think of, I don't know, the number of times my kids, and even my husband, so my, my boys and my husband, how did, you, how did you hear us say that? Well, yeah, 
it's good. It's, it's very adaptive for a mother to have sensitive hearing. Along with the eyes behind our heads, it works well. You know, the peripheral vision, as, as Dr. Savage said, yes. This differential does persist with age. And uh, Dr. Sachs, and I have to agree with him, it is very, he says, as a family practitioner, um, he often had fathers who asked him, you know, what am I supposed to do? My daughter says I yell at her all the time, but I'm just talking in my normal voice. Oftentimes, girls, are, we are more sensitive, and the daughters are hearing, if you have a 40-year-old father talking in his normal voice, that's, that's pretty loud to a girl. Um, whereas boys, I, 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 <laughs> oh, were you calling my name, Mom? I, I didn't hear you. Um, and, and the other example Dr. Sachs uh, offers, too, is ADD is, is definitely overdiagnosed in boys. Um, and one of the first-line treatments, if you will, is if the school teacher um, is complaining that he's just not paying attention, blah, 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 take the child and make sure you maximize the classroom see him closer to the teacher, do everything you can to minimize distractions, and oftentimes, that's the first line. You can take care of the problem. Left brain versus right brain. I mean, most of us grew up being told, left brain is language, right brain is spatial and math. Um, well, it's true if you're a man, not if you're a woman. And this is very fascinating. If a man suffers a left-sided stroke, his verbal IQ goes down at least 20%. If a woman suffers a left-sided stroke, her verbal IQ drops only 9%. A man has a right-sided stroke, he doesn't have any language analysis on the right side, so his, his verbal IQ is fine. But a woman, right-sided stroke, she will drop also close to 9%. And that, as Dr. Wilcox spoke of, gets at the larger corpus callosum. And what you're seeing here, the orange threads, is demonstrating how women's um, brain, their two hemispheres, are maximized to communicate with each other, whereas men's are more compartmentalized on the left and the right. So complementarity of sex difference in brain and behavior, there, there actually was a recent, uh, this is an online journal of neuroscience research, um, the January-February issue was dedicated to the differences between the sexes, and one was, was entitled Complementarity. So again, although men and women are overwhelmingly similar, three decades of research does demonstrate that there are clear and consistent uh, differences in the intrinsic uh, nature of the brains, tissue of the brain, and, as well as its organization. Um, so female brains, higher percentage, they're smaller on average, but we have a higher percentage of gray matter. There's that greater interconnectivity, higher rates of cerebral blood flow. So although men's brains are slightly larger, they have more white matter. Gray matter is the smart part of the brain. Just, just let there be, anyway. Um, <laughs> okay, and you can see, I, I don't have to read to you. Um, women, oh, well this is more, because uh, do I only have 10 minutes? So I gotta hurry, <laughs> okay. Women do perform better on memory and social cognition. Males are better at the spatial processing and motor speed tasks. Um, and again, some of this relates to anatomy, uh, as we were talking about the line, uh, eyes and so forth. This is very interesting. If someone asks me directions, I mean, if you ask a woman for directions, we typically will tell you how to get there very effectively, but using landmarks. I have no concept of miles, and I mean, I know what that means. I can do math, algebra. I mean, I, I tutored in everything up to calculus, but there are distinct differences between how men and women do this, and we use different parts of the brain to do it. Dr. Sachs says this is critical for teachers to understand because girls will learn certain mathematical concepts better in depending on how it's taught and vice versa. Um, sex differences in emotional processing. The amygdala is the most primitive part of the brain. So if you have boys and girls who are young, like age seven, and ask them, oh, how are you feeling? Gee, you look sad. They can't sit down and, and give you like an exegesis on their emotions, right? They're just age seven and they're processing it down in the most primitive part of the brain. Well, boys and men, they tend to not develop uh, above that little level. <laughs> 
Um, women, on the other hand, during the pubertal surge, we develop all kinds of traffic between the amygdala and the cortex. And where's speech taking place? In the cortex. So my daughter, who's 13, like, she can come out with how she's jealous versus envious. Yeah, my, my 17-year-old son, gee, John, you're looking a little down. You know? Yeah. Because you tell me about that. Eh. OK. <laughs> now, yes, teenage boys and men can identify emotions. They can be taught. But they have different hardware, and it, it takes some coaxing and coaching. Um, differences in bonding. There are three, uh, three hormones, at least, that do come into play in both men and women, oxytocin, vasopressin, prolactin. Uh, the differences are in the receptors of the female brain versus the male brain. In women, our brains are saturated with receptors for oxytocin and prolactin, which makes a whole lot of sense because these two hormones are critical for maternal infant bonding. In the third trimester of pregnancy, there is a surge in both of these hormones in women, and um, as well as during labor and post-labor. Oxytocin is the binding and blinding hormone. It is, it's really wonderful when you're post-labor and uh, nature needs for you to be a loving, caring mother, and you really want to forget the pain you just went through. <laughs> um, so oxytocin is a critical bonding hormone between mother and child, and prolactin um, works in concert with that. It's also responsible for milk letdown and milk production. Vasopressin receptors are, occupy a much lower percentage and generally don't do much in terms of bonding in women. Male brains are reversed. Men do have oxytocin and prolactin. And men's levels of oxytocin and prolactin, father's levels, will increase, um, particularly the first few weeks that a baby is born. And the more time they spend with um, the baby and the mother of the baby. Uh, so oxytocin and prolactin do play a role in bonding for men between their wives and their children. But vasopressin, those are the receptors. There's more of those receptors in the man's mind, uh, brain, rather. And uh, that's the, this is my baby. This is, this is my wife, my baby. It's this possessive in a good sense, a possessive in a, and, and this, this protective um, instinct sort of gets triggered and rein, reinforced. So this is some of what, um, I'm looking for Brad, but Dr. Dr. Wilcox, you can see how these contribute to some of the differences between how mothers and fathers care for their infants and children. So the last two slides are just summary slides. Um, so from conception, XY and XX, they are genetic markers of male and female. And sex is an objective, dimorphic, biologic fact it cannot be changed. Um, male and female arise from our sex gene expression, and the genes impact our anatomy and hormone secretion. Together, genes and hormones impact every single body system we have. Um, together with environmental factors, give us our complex behaviors. Rare biologic anatomy, uh, anomalies do not invalidate the rule. Right? It, and it's the basic rule is that man and woman are equal in human nature. Scientifically, yeah, we're both human beings. <laughs> um, but how we approach things can be really different and beautiful and, and truly is complementary. Um, so I like to say we have the same hardware, some differences in software, and these differences are visible throughout the spectrum, from conception through uh, to the natural end of our lives. Um, we're more alike than different. But I think Dr. Sachs is correct. Uh, if we fail to acknowledge these sex differences, not only are we reinforcing damaging stereotypes, but our children and society are, are missing out.
um, there's one line. Ah, oh, I, I wrote, failure to acknowledge biological sex has harmed women for decades. Uh, what I meant, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Uh, what I was trying to say is, for decades, medicine has looked at women as small men, small men who have babies. So for medicine, for institutionalized medicine to look at women as just small men, that has been very harmful to women's health. That's what I meant to write, but I didn't. Okay, and these were the basic references that I used. Thank you.